All right, welcome to the Voices of Wall Street. I have two amazing, spectacular guests, two of the best in the business, are here with me today. We've got Jim Bianco and we've got Danielle DiMartino Bluth, a uh, booth, excuse me. Both of you, welcome and thank you so much for being with us on Voices of Wall Street. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I let's just get it started here. I mean. What I want to hear from the two of you is right now, as you look out into the market, into the economy, um, Danielle, I want to start with you. Are you bullish about what you're seeing? Are you hopeful for the future? Or are you bearish? What's your general stance as it stands today? Well, right now I'm kind of neutral. I'm waiting to see if I can go back to my civics class and, and, and understand what reconciliation is in House and Senate proceedings so that I can figure out exactly how much money and how quickly the Biden administration is going to be able to get money to people or not. So um, so that that's kind of where I am right now. I'm, I'm in a neutral pattern. We're seeing unusually sticky unemployment in this country, and yeah. it doesn't all necessarily uh, attach itself to shutdown states. We're seeing Florida particularly weak, for example. So right now, uh, I, I, I can't tell you where I am. So how's that for a, a a nuanced answer. Yeah, yeah, you're really kind of on the one hand on the other hand. Although it seemed like it was kind of all on the one hand, right? Uh, well, again, money is money. Math is math. Uh, Jim and I recently participated in a roundtable with Ed Hyman, and it, he, he's been around long enough to know that if you put enough money in people's hands, something's going to happen in the economy. You will see the needle move. So if we go from 600 to, to 2,000, and I, I know people who's, who have three kids and they got a check for for three thousand dollars, if that goes up by a, a magnitude, you're gonna you're gonna see more money and, and a higher GDP figure. It's just math. Right. And Jim, what about you? What are your, what are your thoughts? Well, near term, <clears throat> just echoing what Danielle said, the economy is really struggling. Um, we're recording on the day that the initial claims number came out at nearly a million people filing for claims, and that is a worry. Yeah. A lot of the alternative data, if you look at subway rides or people going to the airport or restaurant reservations, they're turning down. They're turning down right now. Even though we've got a vaccine and nearly 10 million people have been vaccinated, it's not coming fast enough, at least for this surge in the virus. So the economy is going to be troublesome, at least for the next quarter or so. But echoing what we were just talking about, we're stuffing people full of money right now. And if we get to the second half of the year and we've got north of 100 million people vaccinated and the summer comes and we get out of the house because indoor is supposedly where we transmit it the most, uh, and then the, the virus goes down and the economy starts to restart, with all that money piling up, there's going to be, I think, a spending burst. And I think there's going to be inflation that's going to follow on that. And the big question for investors mm as I've been trying to emphasize, is there's a difference between reflation and inflation. And right. right now, everybody thinks we're going to get reflation. That's real growth moving forward. If that morphs itself into inflation, that could be problemsome for financial markets throughout the second half of the year. Yeah, yeah. And I want to just drop a couple of numbers. You talked about the uh, the unemployment or the uh, initial jobless claims today. I think it was uh, over 950,000 on the seasonally adjusted number, not seasonally adjusted, just for regular claims, jumped up over a million, I think 1.15 million, that non-seasonally adjusted number, which is what I follow uh, when I when I cover the issue. Also, uh, I think the Biden administration, according to Axios reporting, is uh, proposing three trillion in stimulus in addition to that extra fourteen hundred dollars in checks for individuals and you know more for families. So, yeah, uh, Daniel, I want to kick that to you though. I mean, Jim talked about it—the the potential for inflation. What's your view on the realistic possibility of us getting not just you know the Fed's targeted two percent inflation, uh, but you know real high worrisome levels? Well, so you you don't um, you don't shrink the output gap overnight. But there are some things that I'm starting to pay attention to. There's a very quietly, we're starting to see this percolating headline about the China, uh, about, about the virus coming into China. Now, if, if we see what we're starting to see, which is th throughout the holiday, throughout the holiday in China, throughout the Lunar New Year, if, if, if that economic activity stops, and, and that's what it's looking like it's happening because this is not a Wuhan situation where the virus outbreak is in China right now, it's outside of Beijing. So you're talking about a massive economic center at this point. If we get another supply chain disruption and supply chain disruption is where the true inflation has been feeding through. So if we see another bout of that, then I would, you, you would 
start to think that you would see true commodities inflation. And in addition to that, the Biden administration is talking about infrastructure spending on a scale we haven't seen in a generation. So can you imagine if China's trying to keep its economy going the way it has for the last year? Remember, consumer spending in, in, in China actually decreased last year. And the reason I bring up China, again, it's the marginal driver of global growth. But if you were to see in addition to Chinese continued infrastructure spending, this uh, infrastructure spending on a large scale in the United States, then you could have a sustained hold, hold steady increase in commodities price inflation uh, that carried its way for years to come. Mm. And I don't think markets have that priced in. And what's interesting is we're seeing the inflation right now in goods and not on the services side. Uh, the CPI number came out earlier this week. It was, you know, pretty muted, the highest it's been since August, but still, you know, nothing worrisome, especially on the core side. But we have really seen inflation much more baked into goods than into services. Uh, Jim, want to kick it to you. Uh, Talk to me about what you think about what Danielle said. I mean, is are you watching China? Or what are you watching when it comes to this inflation versus reflation question? Yeah, I am watching China because if they really get humming, they could be a big pull on on resources that could push goods inflation even higher. But you're right. During the lockdown and the immediate afterwards of the lockdown, we were all purchasing goods. Um, you know, sweat pants, sweat pants nation is what we were. We were all out there buying laptops, yeah. getting ready to work from home. I'm wearing sweatpants right now. Yeah, exactly. So we've had good inflation move up. Services, we're not flying, we're not going out to restaurants, we're not going to theaters or to sporting events or the like. That could come on the second half once we get some kind of a reopening in the economy um, as well, too. Keep in mind that as we move forward, that there is going to be a big change. One thing to keep in mind, um, remember, the BLS and the Commerce Department put together a basket, and that is a measure of what we spend our money on. And that goes into calculating the CPI or the inflation index. You spend X percent on housing and X percent on education and X percent mm -hmm. on apparel and food and stuff. Right. Those baskets have been changed in the last year more than any time in history. The pandemic has forced us to rechange the way that we spend our money, and that's not getting picked up in the inflation numbers. So there's an old, there's a saw going around on Wall Street that there's inflation in things you want to buy, like bicycles, and there isn't inflation in things you don't want right now, like, say, airline tickets uh, as well. And that yeah. will change again as the reopening comes. So as you're as we're looking forward out into 2021, Jim, I want to ask this to you, but also send this to you, Danielle. Uh, I mean, how does that play into it? Because I mean, is it is the idea that once we start buying all these things, you're going to see the same inflation baked into those things that haven't seen it that we've seen in the other the goods and things that have? And is that going to pick inflation back up, maybe over three percent or something like that? I think it's going to pick inflation back up. I don't know if we're going to get all the way to three percent. <clears throat> maybe on the headline number if you include the surge of energy prices, but on the core number, keep in mind if we get to 2.6 or 2.7 on the core number, that's the highest level we would have in 30 years. So I've, 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 I've had this conversation with numerous people. I think inflation is going to come back. And their immediate response is, I remember the late 70s. And I was like, no, no, I'm not talking about 10%. I'm talking about 2.7. Right. Well, 2.7 is not inflation. I'm like, no, it's right. a 30-year high is what that would be. And with the 10 year yield at 1.1 and with the stock market at a new high and a forward PE ratio of 24, that's gonna be problematic, I think, for risk markets to see that kind of level of inflation. Even if the Fed says that they want that level of inflation, as Danielle knows I've often right. said, and I know she agrees with it, it's yeah. not up to the Fed to decide what is the level of inflation that is acceptable. It's up to the market to decide it. The market decides 2.7 is too high or 2.6 is too high. Even if Jay Powell says he's fine with it, the Fed's going to be forced to change their yeah. thinking about where and, inflation's going. And Danielle, that question over to you. I mean, the Fed has talked about really been pretty forceful saying we need more inflation. We need more inflation. If you listen to the, you know, I, I would say just the the huge you know, runaway of Fed speakers we've seen over the past week or so, there seems to be this... Uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll call it a pattern of saying we need inflation higher. And, they, you know, it seems like 2.5 would be tolerated, 2.6, 2.7. Uh, 
Uh, really, if you listen to folks, it seems like they're willing to say, hey, all the way up to 3%, that's no big deal. Uh, is that real? What do you make of that? You know, um, people, uh, officials on the Federal Open Market Committee are old enough to remember stagflation. So you, you find yourself saying, watch what you ask for. And remember, if you look back at, at what Jim is speaking to, goods inflation in 2020, what, what were the standout sectors? Interest rate sensitive sectors. What happens to housing and everything we pour into housing if mortgage rates come off their record lows? I think that's the last thing that Jay Powell wants, especially if you're looking at the same time as risky assets coming under pressure, to Jim's point, because the world is not prepared for higher interest rates. The, the refinancing wall in, in, in commercial real estate and in investment grade debt, even though they've even though investment grade debt has expanded out it, its average maturity, but that the, the the refinancing wall in two major sectors of the economy is gigantic in 2021, not so much in high yield. So there are it, it, to me, at least, the Fed should be extremely careful about saying that it wants inflation because once it comes out of its slumber, remember 1981 was the last time we were really worried about rising inflation. I mean, heck, I was in, in middle school. Most people in, in, in the industry, you, you know, you would say the same thing. But once the genie gets let out of her bottle, the Fed's not going to have a say in where inflation goes. Mm -hmm. And I don't think policymakers understand that. They, they spoke, they had this big... They chatted up average inflation targeting, right. and they got a whole 10 basis point move in the tenure. Again, they're not in charge of the narrative, you know, but, except for the tips that they're buying to drive the narrative. Right. It's, it's a watch what you wish for situation. Yeah. I but Daniel, I would say, I think... Can I underscore that real quick? If you look at the sure. last policy changes by the Fed, last year, the Fed turned um, uh, very dovish and started cutting rates like mad. And that's because the pandemic came and the markets reacted to the pandemic. And within two weeks of their FOMC meeting in February, where they said everything's fine, they started cutting rates. The market forced them to do a 180 on their mm -hmm. policy. The fourth quarter of 2018, they laid out a policy for reducing the balance sheet. They said it was going to be on automatic pilot, like watching paint dry. The markets didn't yeah. like that, sold off hard. Within 10 days, they did a 180 on that policy. The last two times the Fed has changed policy, the markets have forced it on them, and it's forced it on them rather quickly. And I think that that's what we need to understand. They can lay out all the plans in the world that they want as long as the market's in, in agreement with them. But if the market ever changes its mind, the Fed is within days of changing policy. That's been the case the last two policy changes. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's absolutely correct. I was actually going to follow up, and Danielle, let me uh, send this question to you. The, there seems to be an expectation in the market that, you know, we won't get inflation, and if we do, the Fed will be able to choke it off really quickly, right? Because the Fed knows how to deal with high inflation. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's a very convenient narrative, and it's the only narrative that makes the, if, if you look at the Schiller 10-year CAPE, uh, price to earnings ratio, it's in the 99th percentile and dated back to 1881. You better stick to that narrative that the Fed's going to be able to control everything or valuations are going to start coming back to haunt you. And you know, I, I think it's it's amusing to hear that, that we're at the advent of a new secular bull market, that this is the beginning of a new 1920s. Uh, but if you look at, at, at the P.E. in December of 2020, excuse me, December 1920, it was 4.8. We're sitting at a, at a multiple that's seven times that right now so uh, you know and i I'd, I'd like to bring up something that that jim spoke to and that's the fed changing its tune quickly mm -hmm. the fed is running out of tools in its toolbox and i don't think oh. market participants have a high enough appreciation Re for that Again, wait hold on just because i gotta i gotta ask you about that because i think folks were saying that back in you know january february of 2020 mm -hmm. and jay pal hit us with qe forever and uh we'll buy everything but the kitchen sink and throw the kitchen sink in too Yep. No. And, and, and it's again, it works, except for the fact that there's this senator in Pennsylvania with the last name of Toomey. And so what went into the latest legislation is that they cannot just pull that they can't just dust off the credit facilities that were rolled out on March the 23rd, 2020. They have to come up with a new with a new mousetrap, with a new type of emergency, with something else to justify the 13-3. And people did not pay close enough attention to that, and that is going to hamstring the Fed. I'm sure that they've got people busy on Liberty Street at the New York Fed trying to figure out what the next program is that they would lay out. But the Fed is almost going to be in a position to where they have to create a black swan because they're going to have to have an emergency 
to be able to have a bazooka, in mm. my view. Okay. And, that's, and, you know, I do think, though, they'll have potentially, it's looking like Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. You got that team of Jelly and JP Money, a.k.a. Dove City, as I like to call them. Uh, you know, I feel like they could come up with something that we haven't even thought about thinking about, you know? Yeah, they could uh, come up Jim, with... Jim can probably speak to everything that Janet Yellen has said would be appropriate under, the, under, under cer certain circumstances. Yeah, I, I'll, just, I'll just underscore. They could come up with... They could be very creative and they could come up with everything they want as long as market participants are signed on to it. But if they want to try and do yield curve control or weighted average maturities extension or invent some other things, increase QE in the face of rising inflation, I think that they'll find that the market will not respond to that very well at all. And as Danielle said, you don't want to be playing those games when you have a P.E. ratio in Case Shiller's 99th percentile. Maybe if it was in the 30th percentile, you'd have a little bit more room to play those games. But you, you know, the old thing on Wall Street right now is we're priced for perfection and we better get that perfection. Hmm. All right. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the labor market. We talked about initial jobless claims a little bit earlier, but we also had that particularly bad uh, jobs report, lost 140,000 jobs in December. Danielle, I want to start with you. What were your thoughts about that jobs report as you dug into it, as I know you do over there at Quill Intelligence? Uh, what did you make of the jobs report and what it says about the labor market going forward? So, you know, I wasn't as, as concerned with the non-farm payroll data as I was with the ADP data. Mm -hmm. And I don't normally fall back on ADP, but it's the construct. It's the fact that the smallest businesses, which unfortunately we've gotten used to permanent closures, it was it was a barbell waiting between the largest companies and the smallest companies. So my concern right now is that you know our our, our joined our our, our um, a mentor of both of ours, David Kotak, you know he he talks about survivorship bias, and I think we're seeing a lot of that in in the in the soft data right now, but. Large corporations in America are using this pandemic and using this time of economic disruption to a use their stock as currency to, to buy other companies because their stock is so expensive so they can acquire a lot more than they could otherwise. But you're going to get synergies out of that. And on top of that, I think corporate America is looking at this as an opportunity to cut out middle management right. and make permanent cost cutting measures move forward with automation at an accelerated pace. And these are jobs, my greatest concern, to use a, a phrase that Carmen Reinhart's been using a lot lately, I, I'm a, a big fan of her uh, as an economist, but the scarring is oh. not being taken into effect. Mm. And a lot of these decent paying jobs are not going to come back, in addition to the fact that it's going to be so difficult to get the small business machine up and running. I'm not talking about PPP loans out to existing companies, I'm talking about fresh new companies. I know census data shows that there's been a lot of businesses created, but hop onto my LinkedIn thread one day and everybody and their dog is, is advertising the same exact thing because they've all had to go out and hang their own shingle. So that's not something that I would consider to be that is a positive for sustained improvement in incomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and this is something I've been writing a lot about in the uh, the Axios Markets newsletter is just this, the way business is changing. Uh, Jim, if you could speak to a little bit, have you been watching this change in business that seems to be going on? And what does that tell you about the future of the labor market? Yeah, the, the thing that um, has got my focus the most is <clears throat> about 30 percent of jobs in America can be effectively done work at home. All three of us can effectively work at home. In fact, we are. 70% of jobs in America can't. A surgeon can't work at home. A waitress can't work at home. Um, a taxi driver can't work at home either. So we're going to have to have some kind of a major restructuring of the economy if we're going to have, even in the restart, we're going to have a lot of people of those 30% staying home one or two days a week. The ancillary services in the big metropolitan play, uh, areas the stores and the restaurants that feed everybody at lunch. You're not going to need as many of those. Even the office towers that we all used to go back to. If we're only going to go back three or four days a week or one or two, we're going to need yeah. 20 to 40 percent less office space if we're not going right. to go back as much. There's going to have to yeah. be a rethink there. So the economy is going to have to have some kind of a major restructuring here. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, higher end jobs can be done at home. Not all of them, but a lot of them can be done at home. 
And I don't think that those people that are doing their jobs effectively at home are appreciating what's going to happen when we go to the reopening, too. And the last thing I give you, too, is I see the surveys that everybody says, I want to go back to work when the uh, reopening starts. But anecdotally, everybody tells me, yeah, a couple of days a week. I don't want to go back five days a week. And I know, like on Wall Street, the banks are insistent on getting everybody back five days a week. Nobody wants to do that um, right now. They'll go back a couple days a week, but they don't want to go back every day. I think we've learned yeah. we can do this effectively at home. And this is going to become a new thing, to Danielle's point, about cutting out mm. middle management. I don't need those guys walking around right. managing everybody for all uh, at home doing it like we have four years. And, we'll and let's, let's get rid of those guys for good, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So last question I want to ask you, because what you spoke to is something that former ECB President Mario Draghi actually spoke with me with, spoke to me about um, about a month ago, was saying this, you know, a lot of this is being masked right now because of all of the central bank easing and the fiscal stimulus. And so we're not seeing it. On that note, one thing that I think has really taken the world by storm is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And a lot of serious folks have kind of dismissed it. But as I wrote about last week, more of these big financial institutions are embracing it. You see, Mass Mutual, as, as someone said, you know, your grandfather's insurance company is now getting into Bitcoin. Danielle, uh, first with you and Jim, I'd love to get your thoughts, and this will be the last question I ask. What are your thoughts on Bitcoin, where it is, what its future is, and, and the kind of, I know a lot of folks have described it as a mania, but just the, the, the excitement about it right now. Well, so um, there are parallels between today and 1999-2000. When you have an anger element that's associated with the security, and when you talk to people about Bitcoin and Tesla on, on social media, which was a platform that didn't exist uh, in 1999 and 2000, but they're, they, they get angry. They, I mean, they're foaming at the mouth crazy people. A lot of them. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, think, I, I look at Bitcoin as being you know, the next generation of pushback against fiat currency that used right. to be expressed through precious metals. So it's not so much that it doesn't have efficacy and the ability to, to have staying power. It's, it's not that we're to turn the hands of time back at all. But right now, the behavior of the security itself is, is you know, you, you can probably have a nice correlation between it and Tesla. If something doesn't make sense, then I'm, I'm just speaking about price wise, then it's going to correct itself. Does that mean that digital currencies are not going to be with us for the rest of time? Absolutely not. But again, nobody knows what the effect of of, of governments looking at their own digital currency, nobody knows what the effect is going to be on Bitcoin and private cryptocurrencies. And this theory that Bitcoin is going to be just adopted and, 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 take, and take out the reserve currency status of countries, that there's an implicit assumption that you're putting away 500 years of history and the fact that countries don't necessarily want to be taken out of the picture. And I mean, it, it, that, that takes us back to where I started this discussion, which is China. So. Uh, you know, it, it sounds it's, it all sounds good in theory, but then you have to bring back into it the fact that we are a global economy and, and there are going to be economic superpowers right. who want to be able to have a weapon of their own as we have mm. weaponized the dollar. And Daniel, when you talk about China, are you talking about they're the digital Redmond B or, or the way that they're mining Bitcoin? No, I'm talking about uh, the digital the, the digital yuan and how they're rolling it out, gotcha. um, how they're looking at it on a practical yeah. level. They're continuously doing a study here in this city, a study there right. in that city. And by the way, if, if they truly are sitting on top of quantum, that changes the economics of Bitcoin in a big way. Right. Yeah. Uh, Jim, what your thoughts? Uh, two. First of all, <clears throat> I do think longer term, bigger picture, if you will that the dollar will res lose its reserve currency to some kind of a digital currency. Now, that's not happening this year. That's not happening next year. Probably yeah. not. No, wait, Jim, is that a digital dollar or is that a digital renminbi or something like a Bitcoin when you say lose it? I don't think it's going to be a digital fiat, if you will. You know, okay. we're not going to change okay. it from a digital dollar. Um, also, I, don't th I think we're going to have a hard time creating a digital dollar. The Fed has already pointed this out in their numerous talks that they're looking at looking at Fed coin is what it's been monikered, you know, their digital uh, U.S. dollar. <clears throat> the problem with that is if you create it, you need a way to have people to be able to use it, which is a fancy way of saying I need a I need an account at the Federal Reserve in order to use their digital dollar. Well, right. if you do that, then I don't know what purpose J.P. Morgan or City or Bank of America bye bye anymore. Banks. If you have if I yeah. can put my money with the Fed and in a digital dollar and if you're going to say, no, we'll create a digital dollar and let. JP Morgan and City 
and Wells Fargo be the front end, then what's the point? You haven't accomplished anything right. at that point. And, and actually, real quick, Jim, I just want to jump in. I've uh, I was speaking with uh, Senate the incoming Senate Banking Committee uh, Chair Sherrod Brown, and he's saying this is exactly what he's trying to do: is set up these Fed accounts so that people can hold their banks directly with the Federal Reserve. So that's at least on the mind of some policymakers. Right, except it's not on the mind of Jamie Dimon. That's the you know that's the thing that will keep him up at right. night if he has to right. compete yeah. with the government and the Federal Reserve in the in the deposit taking business where <clears throat> where he doesn't have to de- compete with it right now. So I think it's going to be more likely it's going to be a crypto. Is it going to be Bitcoin? I've used the analogy of the search engines. You know, first we had Alta Vista and that went out of business. We had Lycos that went bankrupt. Then we had Yahoo and that was very successful. Then we got Google and everything changed. Uh, maybe Bitcoin is more towards the Alta Vista scale on that, or maybe it's more towards the Yahoo scale on that. I'm not sure. But I think that somewhere down the line, either with enough forks in Bitcoin, you know, where they've changed this, the programming of it, or a new currency, new digi- uh, cryptocurrency altogether, that we're going to get some kind of a major adoption of that currency. And last thought for you, I think it comes, I'll term it inside out. When you get a, a, a cryptocurrency that will get adopted as a medium of exchange, it will probably start in the third world because the third world has high cell phone adoption because they've never really had landlines and right. they're getting very comfortable with digital payments anyway. If you go to Kenya, yep. M-Pesa is huge. M-Pesa. In Kenya. They do more digital payments in, in Kenya with our second generation cell phones than we do in the United States. So it will go there. They will use it as their form of currency. It will spread throughout the, the, the third world, then, if you will, into the second world, and then into the first world. Probably the last place it will come, because it will be forced screaming and kicking into it, is the United States, because we're the reserve currency and don't want to give that up. Everybody else will give it up, and then we'll be forced to adopt it as well, too. But this is a process that will take a while to unfold.